much your ministry to us. John 21 tells us that six of Jesus' disciples were together one evening very shortly after Jesus rose from the dead. And evidently they had not much to do because the disciple Peter says, I'm going fishing. The others said, we'll go with you. So they got into a boat and they went fishing all night long and didn't catch a thing. And in the morning as they were coming toward shore, a stranger on the shore said to them, have you caught anything? And when they had to admit that they hadn't caught a thing, the stranger said, well, throw that net in one more time on the right-hand side of the boat. And they said, but we fished all night. Nevertheless, we're going to go ahead and throw it in. So they threw the net in one more time. And the scripture tells us that they couldn't drag the net in because there was so many fish in there. Peter immediately knew who that stranger was. It had to be Jesus. So he threw off his outer garments and swam to the shore to be with Jesus. Well, Jesus fed his disciples a breakfast that morning, and then he took Peter aside and spoke to him specifically. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my lambs. A second time Jesus asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter responded, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus replied to him, shepherd, my sheep. A third time, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Scripture tells us that Peter was grieved that Jesus would ask him that same question three times. He said to Jesus, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And so Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Well, as we come to the fifth chapter of 1 Peter, we see Peter is an old man who's no longer a fisherman because God, through uh, the work of his son there, turned him into a shepherd from a lifetime of experience then. This old shepherd gives an exhortation to other shepherds. And so I want to stand and read these verses. We've already read them once, but let's read 1 Peter 5. 1 through 4 together. 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Lord, how we thank you that you are revealed as that chief shepherd. And you've made provision for shepherding in the flock right here at Emmanuel. I want to thank you for that. Lord, would you open your word to us this morning. The Holy Spirit would be our teacher, that we could understand what your word has to say, that we might walk in it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, in a letter that's addressed to the suffering church scattered among the nations, Peter here 
turns his instructions to the leaders in that church. So this morning, the message from God's word has special significance to those of you who God has called to shepherding, to eldership, here at Emmanuel. But I want you to notice something, that Peter didn't put this message to the elders in a separate epistle and send it along with the letter that was going out. Rather, he included this passage in the general epistle. So the instruction is not just for the leaders. There's also instruction for the congregation, the flock of God in these verses. As God addressed spiritual leaders throughout history, God's people could read those words and know which leaders were worthy of their confidence. For instance, in Jeremiah 23, listen to what God says. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture. And then God condemns those shepherds who shepherded the Israelites by giving visions of their own imagination, saying that they'd received a word from the Lord. God says about them as they prophesied from their dreams, I did not uh, send them or command them, nor do they furnish this people the slightest benefit. So the people of Judah were warned to watch out for a prophet claiming to speak for the Lord, but who was speaking from a dream rather than from God's own word. And in Ezekiel 34, verse 2, he says, Thus says the Lord God, Woe, shepherds of Israel, who've been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? And God goes on to describe how these shepherds were getting fat at the expense of the flock. So the people were wary of those leaders who got ahead by putting additional burdens on those whom they were purportedly leading. In John 10, Jesus distinguished the good shepherd who would give his life for the sheep and the hireling. <clears throat> the hireling was in it for his own gain. He would run when things got tough. The good shepherd would give his life for the sheep. So Jesus' followers were able to understand the true shepherd when Jesus gave his life for them. As we look at 1 Peter 5 this morning, I'd like to suggest to you that even if God has not called you into eldership, God would have you pay attention to his word this morning. Besides being able to recognize a shepherd in whom you can put your confidence, you should be able to apply this passage to yourself as you serve the Lord and his people. Well, as we start looking at this passage, you'll see that the character of the shepherd, the elder, is the focus. Let's examine these verses a little more carefully. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you. Well, notice that Peter didn't exalt himself over the other shepherds over the other elders by, by uh, claiming his apostleship or even his special relationship to Jesus Christ. He was just a humble old man identifying himself only as a fellow elder, yet one who was confident that he too would partake in the glory of Christ. His exhortation then to the fellow elders was to shepherd the flock of God. What does this metaphor mean in the church? What is it to shepherd the flock of God? You know, I'm sure that Peter's experience uh, recounted to us there in John 21, his experience with Jesus by the Sea of Galilee was in his mind as he wrote these words. Two things are apparent from Jesus' encounter with Peter there at the Sea of Galilee. First, remember Jesus' words, feed my sheep. But think about it this way too, feed my sheep. Peter was to feed the sheep, but the sheep belonged to Jesus. 
Emmanuel Bible Church is a flock made up of Jesus' sheep. So the elders need to remember that they're shepherding God's flock. Then the words Jesus chose to use in John 21 speak about shepherding both lambs and full-grown sheep. And the imperatives Jesus uses cover a number of shepherding tasks. So certainly here, Peter was speaking about feeding the flock from the word, of pasturing them, of leading them to drink, of giving them fodder. You see, the shepherd is to promote the spiritual welfare of the flock of God, cherishing the flock and nourishing it, providing for the flock's needs. Yet scriptural shepherding also includes protection of the flock. The shepherd goes before the flock, to meet the dangers himself rather than putting the flock in danger. The flock will hear the voice of the true shepherd and follow him as he leads. And the true shepherd will seek out those who've wandered away. But Peter uses a curious description of the elder's role. Shepherd the flock of God, exercising oversight. You know, the Bible speaks about this oversight role of the shepherd, of the spiritual shepherd. In, uh, for instance, in Hebrews 13, 17, and also in 1 Timothy 5, 17. It's the job of the elder to rule or to govern in the church as they exercise oversight over the souls under their care. Their care. After all, they do have to give an account for each one to God. But notice that in our text, shepherding is the imperative. Shepherd the flock of God, exercising oversight. To give oversight is part of the job description of the shepherd. But it's secondary in the text. You see, shepherding is primarily about relationship. The relationship of the shepherd with his sheep. Remember again what Jesus said in John 10. The good shepherd loves the sheep so much that he gives his life for the sheep. The sheep hear his voice and he knows them and they know him and they follow him. The sheep follow him because they know his voice. Now, exercising oversight is predominantly about tasks. So Peter's word shows the relationship of the elder with his flock comes first. The elder is effective in in exercising oversight only if the relationship component in shepherding is firmly in place. As the elders exercise oversight, spiritual power in their ministry does not consist of the authority to pontificate or even to make a significant decisions. In fact, elders who haven't heard from the chief shepherd yet render their own uh, decision or insist on their own agendas are not serving as under shepherds. Rather, they exalt themselves before others and thus diminish in the flock's eyes the role of the chief shepherd, Jesus. This is one of the reasons the apostle Paul warns so clearly about appointing elders who are new converts. In 1 Timothy 3.6, for instance, if he's appointed to give oversight of the church, the immature believer easily becomes proud. It can easily go to his head and he falls to sin, just as did Satan. If Peter was standing here today, then, he would assure us that the elder board meeting is not where the priority, of minist- the priority ministry of shepherding is done at Emmanuel. Rather, spiritual power in ministry is seen as the flock, as the Spirit of God works through the elders to lovingly shepherd his flock. For just a minute, I'd like to address those of you in the congregation this morning whom God has called uh, to eldership here at Emmanuel. What kind of a shepherd are you to those entrusted to your care? Are you careful what you feed them? 
Do you let them become prey to the wild beasts that would devour them? Do you bind the wounded? Do you lead them to pasture where they can rest? Do you lead them to the living water to quench their thirst? Or maybe has exercising oversight gone to your head? As the Apostle Peter tells the elders to shepherd, giving oversight to the flock, he speaks to character traits that those elders were to exhibit. So starting in the middle of verse 2, Peter gives three contrasts that define God's design for shepherding. Notice, first of all, that he says that elders are to shepherd not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God. You know, there's been some who felt compelled to serve because they've been told it's expected of you or you were elected to do it or even God has gifted you to be able to serve well in this way. There are some who feel a compulsion to serve as elders because of a desire to have others think well of them. And to me, one of the saddest things to see is a shepherd who feels compelled to serve because he's paid to do his work and he's unsure of how he might make a living in some other way and he's afraid to trust the Lord to supply for him. You see, there's all kinds of reasons for feeling compelled to serve. But there are those shepherds who serve voluntarily They want to shepherd the flock, serving the Lord in the way he's gifted them to serve. They choose to be obedient to his calling. And yet note that the text says here, according to the will of God. I think Peter uses those words because there are some shepherds who want to shepherd, uh, some people who want to shepherd, but it's not God's will that they serve in this way. Their ministry would be ineffective because God has neither gifted them for it nor called them to it. But they want to shepherd, exercising oversight still. So it's important that the elders at Emmanuel shepherd voluntarily according to the will of God. Note the next contrast at the end of verse 2. Not for sordid gain but with eagerness. Often the Christian minister is caricaturized as a sleazy con artist sticking his hand into the back pocket of the church members through the church offering. And it's sad because so many have gone into ministry with base motives to take advantage of the flock that many Americans think that being in the ministry is a pretty good racket to be in. You know, it's not wrong to get paid for doing ministry, but payment should not be the elder's motive. And certainly, how much he is paid should not motivate him at all in ministry. And then it's possible to be in ministry for sordid gain. You know, the the old King James used an interesting phrase there. It called that filthy lucre. And I kind of like that. Lucre speaks to money or gain, you know, some some way you're getting paid. Filthy speaks about dirty money, okay? There's ways to be paid for sordid gain without being, at sordid gain, without being paid in cold, hard cash. The elder might get paid through the ego trip of exercising spiritual authority and receiving public attention and respect. He might even get paid in being able to manipulate people in events to his liking or to his advantage. Just like so many politicians in politics, the elder might be in ministry for sordid gain because he gets paid by being able to push his agenda, push his program. All of these are sordid gain. Let me speak again directly to you who are elders here at EBC. Are you eager to serve the Lord or are you in it for sordid gain? 
You know, I love the picture of, igno- uh, of eagerness. Ignorance. <laughs> I love the picture of eagerness that I get when I think of, of uh, <clears throat> a, a golden retriever that is just waiting for you to throw that stick or throw that ball. You know, you can see every limb trembling. Have you seen that? That's a picture of eagerness. But let me ask you, what's his motivation? What's in it for him? Not sordid gain for sure. (laughs) No, it's just that he can hardly wait just for the joy of chasing that stick you're throwing. I want to ask you elders, do you fit that picture of eagerness when you see an opportunity to shepherd? Or are you done with shepherding when there's no longer any gain in it for you? Here are some good questions for you to consider. Do you feel underappreciated because you feel entitled to some form of gain, financial or otherwise, that you're not presently receiving? Does the flock see you as a giving shepherd or a taking shepherd? How does God see your heart? Remember, he knows what motivates you. He sees that clearly. If you no longer have eagerness for shepherding when there's no longer any gain in it for you, then face it. You're motivated by sordid gain. The third contrast Peter gives is in verse 3. Nor yet is lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples of the flock. Again, the office of elder, the shepherd in the flock, is not a power office. You can't lord it over sheep. I've tried it. I had some sheep out by my house, you know, to keep the pasture grass down. And I'd try telling them what to do and where to go. And they don't listen. They don't listen. I don't care if you're the best, most talented general in the army. You can't get the sheep to listen to you. Isaiah says it so clearly. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. That's the nature of sheep. And that's our nature. You can't lord it over sheep. It doesn't work. The only way a flock of sheep will move together safely is if the shepherd will walk ahead of them, showing them the way by his example. He shows them the safe path through the rocks and beside the cliffs. He's the one who will lead them by quiet waters. And so Peter tells the elders not to lord it over the flock, but rather to lead by example. The elders should show by example what it is to submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. He should show by example what it is to walk in the light. He should lead by example in a walk of faith. He should teach by example what the obedience of faith is all about. His life should show the good works that prove true repentance and faith toward God. He should show what love and forgiveness look like. He should be the one to show by example what faithful, selfless service is all about. He should show what it is to be a living sacrifice by climbing down off the throne of his own life and climbing back on the altar. He should show what it is to worship God alone as Jesus is on the throne in his life. From the time I was a child, I loved to watch my dad drive through the mountains. You know, dad was so good at it, he'd, he'd use the clutch. You know, I could see real early as a child as I'd sit beside him in the seat there. We used to have bench seats. Remember back in those days, no seat belts? And metal dashboards and so as we were going down the road I'd be in the front seat right beside him and like is not standing there watching him so I could see him real good but I'd watch how he'd use the clutch and how he'd use those gears 
you know, and the gas pedal and the brake to control the speed and the power of the car. And I'd watch him use that steering wheel to navigate us around the corners. You know, it was fun because as I listened later, you know, as I got more and more into it, I'd listen to the sound of the motor. And I would try to anticipate when Dad was going to let up on the gas and put in the clutch and shift into second gear and let it out and step on the gas again and what it was going to sound like as we ran, went around that corner and not too fast but still with power and powering out of the corner instead of into it. I learned all of that. I could, I could copy Dad's m movements, you know. But one night... Mom and Dad were gone, and a missionary returned Dad's car. And so Dad uh, and left the keys with me. And I was looking at that car for a while, and I thought, you know, that would be fun to put this thing in the garage for Dad. And so I got in the car, and I got on the front of that bench seat. You know, I had to get way, way up front. And I had to hold myself there with the steering wheel because I didn't want to slip back or I wouldn't be able to reach the pedals. And I took my tiptoe, stuck it down on the clutch, and turned the car on. Everything was good. Put it into first gear. Let the clutch out with this while just barely pressing the gas with this foot. And I put that car right into the garage. I got it stopped before I hit the end wall. That was fun. I decided I was going to back it out again. <laughs> and do it again. I, I had to do that again. That was really great. And so in and out a few times until one of those times I was turned around like this, looking over my shoulder as I was backing out so I didn't hit anything. And I saw my grandfather silhouetted in his window that looked over across the field at our house. And Grandpa was just standing there, kind of like this. <laughs> I knew exactly who it was. Boy, I, I didn't even finish backing out. I just put that car right back in the garage. And I put the window down. You know, we had to crank them down back then. And when you turned the car off, inside light didn't come on. But I shut off the lights. And I climbed out that window of that car and snuck around to the back of the house and I climbed in the back window of the house so he wouldn't have any idea who drove the car in the garage. <laughs> and Grandpa came over and he says, Dan, was that you driving the car? I said, yes, sir. He says, oh, I was wondering. And he went back home. That's the last I ever heard of it. <laughs> okay, the point is this. Dad never explained to me how to drive a car. He just showed me by example. But can you imagine how many hours I was sitting beside him in that car? You know, I was just a little kid, but I was sitting in that car beside him, watching him, copying what he was doing. But Dad had to give me a faithful Example, day after day, hour after hour, year after year of driving well in the mountains for me to be able to drive the car on my own. I had to know from his example. He had to be faithful in giving that example. Well, that's how an elder teaches the flock of God to follow Jesus Christ. The sheep watch his walk day after day and year after year as he faithfully follows the chief shepherd. An elder at Emmanuel can explain over and over and over again how to follow Jesus. But the way the flock will learn to walk in the light following Jesus is when the shepherd walks with the sheep, spending time with them, faithfully leading them by always pointing them to the chief shepherd. Verse 5 says that when the chief shepherd appears, 
the elders will receive the unfading crown of glory. You know, I don't know if it's a literal crown that the elders are going to get to put on their, their head. Uh, I kind of think it's not. I know we're going to be crowned with glory. But the reason I don't think so is because it says it's an unfading crown of glory, which would lend the idea, to the idea that it's a, one of those wreaths of leaves that they would put on the head of the victor in a race or a wrestling match. But, you know, the next day, that crown sure wasn't worth much, was it? It would have faded. And the glory wouldn't be worth all that much. How many people have received a crown like that down through the ages? We don't know anything about them. Where's the glory? In fact, if you're on top today, tomorrow, when you're wrestling against another guy, they might beat you. And there's coming a day for sure when they will. And where's the glory? It all goes to him then. The crown goes to him. But look at what we get. As elders who shepherd faithfully, we get an unfading, an unfading crown of glory. Not something that's going to wither. Not something that the glory is going to depart. It's not going to dry up. Someone else not, is not going to win it away from us. So the faithful shepherd is promised that unfading crown of glory. You know, often shepherding Jesus' flock is rather messy. Shepherds who love the sheep and who shepherd well rarely come out unscathed. There's always a cost to serving Jesus. But those of you whom God has called to shepherding should take heart. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. That's God's promise to his faithful under shepherds. Well, as we read the scriptures, we should always be looking at the so what factor. As we finish this morning, then I want to ask, so what? What difference does this message make? What practical application can we draw? I want to look at the application for both the under-shepherds and for the flock. First of all, I want to speak to those who are elders or who are aspiring elders <clears throat> to make sure of your calling. One, do you see yourself as a shepherd in the flock or do you see yourself as an under-shepherd? How you view your role makes a tremendous difference in the way you do it, in the way you'll exercise oversight here at Emmanuel Bible Church. Never forget, Jesus himself is the chief shepherd. He's the one who calls the shots. The buck stops with him. All you're doing is taking orders and loving people where his love, his life is shown day after day, year after year, as it's shown through you. I'd like you to take some time, secondly here, to examine yourself, examine your motives for service. Ask God to reveal those motives of your heart to you. Look for objective evidences of your motives. Are you serving because you feel in some way compelled to serve in some way other than by God? Or are you happily choosing to serve, voluntarily serving? Because God has called and gifted you to shepherd and you want to serve him? The second thing to think about would be, are you serving for sordid gain? That is, what you can get out of it. 
Or is it because you're eager to serve? Or are you so uneager, that is, so reluctant, that you resist even the compelling encouragement of others who see God's calling and gifting in you? As you look for objective evidences and your motives, the third thing here, has your ministry been effective because you relate to the sh- as you relate to the sheep, the sheep are following your walk? Or have you been content to specialize in fulfilling tasks or being perceived as an effective board member, contributing to good decisions? Remember, God has called you to be an example, first of all. And then lastly to you, elders, does your ministry measure up to Peter's standards? None of us, shepherds, are perfect, not a one of us. But if you see failure in your shepherding, remember that there's forgiveness in Jesus. Peter certainly would testify to that. Remember his failure? And yet he knew a Lord and a Savior, the great shepherd, who was forgiving to him. There's forgiveness in Jesus. Peter would encourage us in that because he experienced such forgiveness from Jesus. Now, for all the rest of God's flock here this morning, I have two main areas of application to point out to you. Number one, even if God has not specifically called you into shepherding, I'm talking about as an elder, in the office of elder, because he has called you in some way to shepherd in your family, at a minimum. But even if God has not called you into shepherding as an elder, It's important to note that these principles of service, these principles for serving God, apply to every Christian in his ministry. They hold true for any servant of the Lord. And then I'd like to just also point out that this instruction is given for people to take note of their leaders in the church. Recognize God's hand in appointing under shepherds to lead you, first of all. That's God's plan. Do you realize the life, the very love of the Lord Jesus is shown to the flock through under shepherds? That's God's plan. That's how it's supposed to be. But when you see shepherds who serve unwillingly, that is, under compulsion, when you see them in ministry for their own gain, or when you see that their ministry revolves around them, not around the great shepherd, then take heed. But as you see shepherds, Leaders who eagerly choose to serve the Lord as under-shepherds of his flock recognize that they serve according to the will of God. Then take note of their lives and follow them as they follow Christ. Learn from their example. Welcome them into your lives and walk with them in the light. I'd like to uh, just ask you as we close this morning, Let's stand and sing the doxology. Remember that Jesus is that chief shepherd. God showed his love to us through Jesus. And he wants those under shepherds to also show his life and his love to the flock. Let's sing praising our triune God then. Praise God from whom all blessings.
Let me read just a few words from the scripture here. These are the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. Now the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. You're dismissed.